And so the, since the book was published, a lot of scientists have found the book, read it, gotten excited about it, and then gotten in touch with you. Um, tell me about that process. Well, it's happened on a level and at a speed which still boggles my mind. Every day, new things are coming up. Um, in the book, I propose a, a global nonprofit energy consortium that would maintain, would supervise the building of nuclear plants, would manage nuclear plants, would essentially take control of the entire fuel cycle so that it would never be in the hands of private corporations. It might be tempted to cut corners, uh, to not train their employees well. Um, the idea was that we want to reduce the proliferation and accident risks to the ex to the smallest degree possible, even though the reactor itself is so safe that it will shut itself down with, with uh, worst case scenarios where they don't have loss of uh, heat sink or loss of flow and all the operators are dead, the thing will just shut itself down just because of the physics of the materials. But you want to have uh, international control over fissile material, no matter what kind of reactors you use, just to keep it, for, even to keep people from getting a hold of it for dirty bombs or whatever. Um, some people saw this as politically naive to think that we could get all the nations of the world to cooperate, even if it meant unlimited energy for every nation. Um, and one of the people who didn't think it was politically naive at all is the person who's managed Russia's nuclear program for since Gorbachev, who uh, really wanted to take this and run with it. So we formed uh, an international uh, NGO called uh, Science Council for Global Initiatives. And um, we've been uh, getting some of the top people in India, Russia, the United States, France, we're bringing in China, South Korea, uh, to actually create this global energy consortium and try to make uh, the vision of prescription for the planet a reality in less than six months. It's, my head is spinning. So it, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening as we speak. Um, one uh, kind of influential uh, person when it comes to global warming that I know has picked up your book and liked it is Jim Hansen, which is our next slide. So if we could put Jim Hansen up there. You want to tell me a little bit about your conversations with Jim Hansen about the global energy revolution? Well, uh, Jim is uh, probably the most widely known and respected climatologist in the world. Um, he became somewhat of a celebrity when the Bush administration tried to shut him up when he started talking about how serious global warming is. Uh, Jim is the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and so it was difficult for the Bush administration to kind of just shuffle him under the rug. And he wasn't about to stop uh, talking about it just because they were putting the elbow to him. So um, he's, uh, he's Al Gore, he was Al Gore's main science advisor uh, in, in the run-up to the creation of the Inconvenient, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, Gore's famous film. And, um, and he, he wants to build uh, an integral fast reactor. He said, even if even if renewable energy can supply everything we need, this would be a cheap insurance policy mm -hmm. so, that, um, so that we could uh, have it available just in case we find five or ten years down the road that it can't produce everything we need. Okay, now I understand the appeal of renewable energy like solar energy and wind energy. I mean, the sun, is, sun shines as long as it's, <clears throat> well, as long as it's daytime and sunny out. And the wind often blows, it blows really strong in some places. Actually, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning is when it blows hardest. It blows hardest at 2 in the morning. When you need the energy less. Right, well, that's true. Um, and I remember reading in one of the articles that if you add up solar and wind energy, that they provide a total of about 2% of the U.S. energy demand right now. Um, I would imagine the figure worldwide is probably less. It's yeah, around 1% to 2%, yes. So if people say, well, skip the fast re or integral fast reactor, why don't we just use solar and wind? They, they need to, well, what would you say? What would you say? Well, I would say that solar and wind are great, but uh, you, you can't build something in a laboratory or on a small scale and just expect that it, you can scale it up to any scale whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, Scientific American did a, an, a special edition on solar power 
And they, they came to the conclusion that in order to provide 69% of the electricity that the United States needs, uh, we'd have to build 30,000 square miles of solar panels. Now, that's just 69%. Mm -hmm. 30,000 square miles of solar panels. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, imagine what a square mile consists of, a, mile, a square that's a mile on each side. You'd mm -hmm. have to cover completely cover two of those every day, seven days a week, until the middle of the century to reach that point, at, mm -hmm. which, at which point you'd only have two-thirds of the ener energy you need anyway. It seems like we ought to find a better way. There are many better ways. You know, it would be great. Uh, whatever wind and solar can bring to the table is fine, but mm -hmm. they, they have their problems with intermittency, and it makes it very, very difficult for utility companies to maintain a stability in the grid because uh, they're coming and going whenever they please. Um, nuclear power, on the other hand, provides base load power 24-7, and it can be relied on, and it can follow the load. So, uh, you know, when solar is, solar is producing during the day, when, wind, when the wind is blowing, the nuclear plants can either throttle back or, better yet, be used for something else more productive like uh, desalination, for instance, which we're going to need a lot of considering that we're already short of water in many places in the world. Mm -hmm. um, there are two colliding realities. One is the demographics uh, indicate that we'll have 9 to 10 billion people by the middle of the century, about 50% more than we have now. Meanwhile, the glaciers on which billions of people depend for water from the Himalayas and the Andes are melting. They're mm -hmm. retreating. So water supplies are getting tighter. Populations are getting larger. The only place we can get water is desalination wow. and massive desalination. And that takes a lot of energy. Well, if we build integral fast reactors and build dual desalination electricity production, we can do it. There's plenty of fuel, and it's free. It sounds like a, a fabulous plan. So what can people do? For your viewers out here that are watching and they say, I know enough to know that I'm basically interested in it. I think this is a plan that, that the, the government should try and put into place, or how can we make this a reality? Well, people have actually come up to me and said, I want to offer my land as a place to build an integral fast reactor. Really? <laughs> This is somebody that really wants to get out there and do something. I know it's, it's frustrating for somebody who wants to take action to look at something that's basically a, a mega policy decision that has to be made. I mean, these, these are decisions that have to be, be made on the very highest level of national and international governing. Um, I think what people can do, aside from the logical things like putting in compact fluorescent light bulbs instead of incandescents and that sort of thing, uh, is educate themselves mm -hmm. and educate their friends and create a situation where our politicians are going to be pressured, are going to be forced by public pressure to make the decisions that have to be made. Because you know that the lobbyists for the coal and the oil industries and all all the status quo industries that are going to be threatened by a, a global energy revolution are going to be putting all kinds of pressure on the politicians. And unfortunately, the way our system works with campaign finance being done on a large part by corporations, um, it's going to take a lot of pressure. It is. Thank you, Tom. One last mention, prescription for the planet. You can get it from Amazon.com or the Avid Reader here in Davis. This has been On The Wire. My name is Mark Graham, and this has been Tom Bleese. Good night. Thanks. Wow, that went fast. Yeah, it did, didn't it? We got to the 10 minute mark. Yeah. <laughs>